Happy Mother's Day, Crossroads Church. Hey, we're so glad that you're spending Mother's Day with us. I heard a funny story about Queen Elizabeth that just made me laugh. Apparently, she was out for a walk in the British countryside with her bodyguard, and um, they stumble across a couple of American tourists who had no idea who she was. And so they fall into step, they strike up a conversation, and they asked her, have you ever seen the queen? Now, Queen Elizabeth had a lovely sense of humor, so she gestures to her bodyguard and she said, he sees her all the time. The tourists freaked out and they immediately asked Queen Elizabeth to take their picture with her bodyguard. (laughs) Okay, so her bodyguard is super gracious and he insists, no, you also want a photo with her. And as they go their separate ways, she leans over and she said, Oh, to be a fly on the wall when someone tells them who I am. (laughs) Isn't that great? That made me laugh. Well, hey, uh, today we're starting a brand new sermon series called Thrones. Unfortunately, we live in a cultural climate where identity is this huge cause for question. And people just don't recognize who King Jesus is and who they are. They don't know. I want us to look at John chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. It says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, He gave the right to become children of God. Did you catch what that scripture said? It says, if you believe in King Jesus, the light of the world, you become a child of God. Now listen, men, everything I'm going to say today, it's all biblical principles. It can be applied to you. Don't, don't, you know, drift off or anything. There's going to be a quiz. Um, But... I have a message today. It is, it's Mother's Day. I have a message today for the daughters of the house. So ladies, when you believe in King Jesus, you become a child of God. You become a daughter of the Most High God. You are made a co-heir with Christ. You will inherit the kingdom of God. And the role that he has called you to play is not a passive one. He has called you to an active participation role in this story. You have been crowned queen. That's the title of today's message, the crowned queen. I want us to look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. It says, And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. You are crowned queen, and you are crowned to rule. The thing is, ladies, you can't rule if you don't know who you are. There may be some of you here under the sound of my voice, some of you um, joining us online, you are feeling unworthy of being called a daughter. Maybe you've done something that you're not proud of and you've allowed shame to rob you of your royalty. What I want to remind you of is Romans chapter eight, verses one through two says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And then Philippians 1, 6 reassures us that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He's not done with you. He's not done with you. And today I want you to remind your shame that you've been bought with a price. Reclaim your royalty. Step into your queenship. You have been crowned to rule. Not only are you crowned to rule, but you've been crowned to feed your people. As a mom, this feels like a never-ending responsibility. Right, ladies? (laughs) I have two small children, and I feel like I am always asking them, 
how do you eat so much? Where did it go? You are so tiny. Where did it go? Especially if it's a question of breakfast food. Listen, don't, don't doubt for a second how many biscuits, pancakes, and bacon my son can put away. That kid can eat some breakfast food. In the Bible, food is used again and again as a metaphor for spiritual growth. As parents, we are not only responsible for feeding our families physical food, but it is our job to provide spiritual nourishment as well. The quintessential Mother's Day scripture is 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, where Paul says to Timothy, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois, and then in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Lois and Eunice were queens who recognized their responsibility to make sure Timothy was spiritually fed. So what does that look like? Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. It says, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all your soul, and with all your strength. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. If our children see us loving the Lord our God with all of our hearts, souls, mind, and strength, and we're engaging with them in conversation about the Lord in both public and private settings, as we start our day and as we end our day, we will be spreading a feast for them to taste and see that the Lord is good. Listen, what we're able to do here, what we're able to do here at Crossroads Church in our children's ministry and in our youth ministry is a partnership with you. Our job is not to replace you as the parents, but to support you as the parents as you pastor your families and your homes. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The word of God equips us for the role that we have been crowned to play, and it equips those that we are crowned to lead. So we need to know the word of God. Now, I want to pause here to give you a word of encouragement. A lot of times I'll ask my friends or ask somebody, hey, how's your walk with Jesus going? How's, how's your Bible reading time going? What does it look like? And a lot of times people will answer, I just don't have the time for it. Um, it's not something that I'm, I have a habit of right now. And I want to stop here because the image that we have in our minds of our quiet time with Jesus is often this beautiful moment where it's early, it's dark, it's quiet, everybody else is still sleeping, we have our hot cup of coffee that we get to drink while it's hot, everybody else is away where there's no interruptions, we have our Bible, we have our journal, we have our devotional books, we have our worship music, and we get to enjoy all of it for a whole hour or maybe two. Isn't that a beautiful image? It's not reality. <laughs> That's not reality for so many of us. And if it is your reality, then hey, hats off to you. I'm so glad for you. But it's just not reality for so very many of us. I want to stop right, right now and encourage you. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Don't be all or nothing. If your quiet time alone with Jesus is actually quite loud and interrupted by tiny humans. That's okay. There is grace for this season. And hey, it still counts. It still counts. You might be saying, hey, I have a little bit of time. I just don't have the habit right now. I want to encourage you too. That's okay. In his book, Atomic Habits, James Clear talks about starting habits so small that you actually feel a little bit ridiculous doing them. For example, he says, go to the gym 
for five minutes and then leave. Write a single sentence. Save a single dollar. The idea is that when you start a habit this small, you're gonna have an urge in your heart to continue the habit. I'm at the gym already. I may as well stay for 10 minutes this time. I saved $1. I may as well save two. Clear says that the reason this strategy works is because it casts votes for who it is that you want to become. If you went to the gym for five minutes, yes, I am a runner. Yes, I am a saver. Yes, I am a writer. Let me make this super duper practical for you. If you have a smartphone, there's an app called the Bible app. You can download it and it will send you a push notification of the scripture verse of the day. Why not start there? Start small, start with a a single scripture. And then over time, you're gonna realize there's a hunger in your heart for more of the word of God. Well, I'm already reading one scripture. Why not two? Why not a passage? Why not a chapter? You're gonna realize that you are casting votes for who it is you want to become, and soon you're gonna say, yes, I am a student of the word of God. Yes, I am a servant of God equipped for every good work. Yes, I am a co-heir with Christ, crowned queen to rule and to feed my people. Ladies, you've also been crowned to heal your people. When I was first preparing for this message, I felt like the Lord first impressed on my heart, what is it that moms do? Moms are the ones who soothe fevers, who kiss bobos, who hold your hand when something hurts, right? There are hurting, broken people everywhere we look. We have been tasked with the responsibility of sharing the healing that we have received. But the thing is, first, we have to receive it. You cannot sue the fever if you yourself are bleeding out. So many of our health problems can be traced back to what we consume. Can I preach in a circle here for a minute? If you are malnourished, you're going to get sick. If you are not consuming the proper vitamins, minerals, and calories, you will not be strong enough to withstand sickness. Hey, and likewise, if you are not in the presence of God daily, if you are not in the presence of God, nourishing yourself on the bread of life, you will not be strong enough to withstand the attacks of the enemy. James chapter five, verse 13 through 16 says, is any one of you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. In order to be healthy, we must put a health regimen in place. We need to be in the word of God. We need to surround ourselves with people who will call us out when we're not taking care of ourselves or who will take care of us when we can't. We need to keep regular doctor's appointments. That's not a metaphor. I mean that literally. Go see your physician. Go see your counselor. Go get healthy. Take care of yourself. 3 John 2 is a scripture we use regularly around here because it is so important. It says, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. What is this saying? It's saying, yes, your spiritual health matters, but so does your physical health. So does your mental health. So does your relational health. Jesus cares about every facet of your life. And if Jesus cares about it, then so should we. They say that hurt people hurt people, but healed people heal people. 
A few weeks ago, we were at our Louisiana Assemblies of God Network conference. They had a guest speaker by the name of Ed Stetzer who said something so profound that you are going to be hearing us use it regularly. It was just so powerful. He said, the moment that we're in doesn't pause the mission that we're on. The moment that we're in doesn't pause the mission that we're on. Our world is filled with hurting, broken, bleeding people. They show up regularly here at church, but in our neighborhoods, in our offices, in our friend circles, there's people bleeding out. They may never make it to church. So the church needs to be the one to rise up, shoulder our first aid kit, and bring medicine to the sick. Can I say something? Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Can I say something really brutally honest with you? This year has been super hard. It's been really difficult. And I think we all have enough experience to know that this year is going to continue to be difficult. It's only going to get harder. The potential for division the potential for relationships to be caught in the crossfire, for blame to be cast, for bitterness to grow, the potential for sickness to spread is tremendous. But the potential for healing to be shared, for gracious words like a honeycomb, healing to the bones to be spoken, the potential for bridges to be built, the potential for wounds to be mended is also tremendous. And wise is the woman who stocks her first aid kit. Let's bring medicine to the sick. Ladies, you've been crowned queen to rule. You've been crowned to feed your people. You've been crowned to heal your people. And finally, You've been crowned to lead fearlessly. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 25, is talking about the woman of virtue. It says, strength and honor are her clothing, and she can laugh at the time to come. I struggle with anxiety. I have for many years. In normal circumstances, when everybody else is minding their own business, my mind is busy painting pictures of worst-case scenarios. What I've learned is that one of the best things I can do for myself in those moments is often the very thing that I'm anxious about. So let me give you a very mild example. I've been involved in a number of car accidents, I realize how terrible that sounds. I promise I'm a good driver. They weren't my fault. Um, But as a result, I'm now very anxious when we go on trips. And if you know me and my family, you know my husband's family lives in Georgia, which means we take trips regularly. So when that anxiety comes up, often the best thing I can do is to say a prayer and get in the car. Do I pray for most of the trip? Yes, I do. Do I have other coping mechanisms as well? Absolutely. But then I get out of the car again in Georgia, (sighs) breathe a sigh of relief, because we made it, and I'm okay. Getting in the car is just one example of me laughing at the days to come. Maybe for you, it's stepping out to form a friendship, even though you have a deep-rooted fear of abandonment. Maybe for you, it's you and your spouse deciding it's time to open your home to foster care children despite the uncertainties. Maybe the Lord has asked you to lead a small group next small group semester and you are fearful that you're not going to know how to lead. For you, taking that first step to sign up for more information is you laughing at the days to come. It's an act of bravery when we feel most afraid, an act of vulnerability to express that despite fears in our hearts and doubts in our minds, we will trust the Lord with this. 
I can't think of a more beautiful example to set for our families. I think there is an unspoken fear that if we allow our children to see us afraid, we're going to pass on those fears to our kids. But the reality is, whether I like it or not, my kids know that I get anxious. If nothing else tips them off, when another car gets too close and they see mama go, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, they know. (laughs) They know that mama has some fears. But I hope that by seeing me acknowledge those anxieties and choose to be brave, I'll pass down the ability to laugh at the days to come instead. Ladies, you have been crowned to rule, to feed your people, to heal your people, and to lead fearlessly. Would you stand all over the auditorium? Men, I told you there'd be a quiz. Would you take this opportunity to pray over the women in your lives? And ladies, would you stretch your arms up to heaven? I want to pray a blessing over you. I pray in the name of Jesus that each and every woman under the sound of my voice would know the destiny that she is called into, that she is called blessed and highly favored daughter of the King. I pray that she will recognize the King that you are, Jesus, the royal daughter that you have created her to be. Let her step into her queenship with authority and grace, dressed with strength and dignity. I pray that she would have a hunger in her heart to spend time in your presence and to know your word. I pray that she would be prepared in season and out of season to preach the word of God to those that you have given her. I pray that her words will be filled with grace and seasoned with salt, a healing balm to the broken people around her. I pray that she will be healthy and whole, that her household will be made healthy and whole, and that as she pursues health for herself, that it will overflow to those around her. And Lord, may she be filled with courage as she leads, laughing at the days to come. Thank you, Jesus, for choosing your daughters. May we represent you well. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us for today's message. You may be someone who's never really put your trust and your faith in Jesus as your own personal Lord and Savior. Uh, Maybe you're not really living for God, you're just living for you, but down in your heart, you know something's not quite right and you, you need to get right with God. I wanna give you an opportunity to do that right now. You know, the Bible makes it clear that all of us are sinners and all of us need a Savior. And Jesus is that Savior. He died on the cross for my sins, for your sins. And the scriptures tell us that if we'll simply put our trust and our faith in him, if we'll turn our lives over to him, that he'll forgive our sins. He'll make us right with God. He'll give us a brand new life here and now and an eternal life when this life is over. If you have no assurance of that, but you want that assurance today, then let me encourage you. Romans chapter 10 and verse 13 says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God loves you and he longs to save you. He's just waiting on you to call on him. So we're gonna do that together right now by praying a very simple prayer. And I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Just repeat the words of this prayer after me, but let them come right from your heart and mean them with all your heart. And God's gonna hear your prayer. He's going to forgive your sins and he's gonna make you right with God. Let's, Let's pray together right now. Dear God, I come to you right now in the name of Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner and I know my sin separates me from God. I don't want that. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for me and rose again. And through faith in Jesus, I believe my life can change. So I ask you, Jesus, come into my heart, forgive all my sin and change my life. Be Lord of my life. From this day forward, I don't live for me anymore or this world. God, I want to live for you. Help me to do that. And God, I thank you right now, even as I pray, according to your promise, my sins are forgiven. I'm now right with God. I am saved. Thank you, God, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. 
and amen. If you just prayed that prayer, we are so excited. God has written your name down in what the Bible calls the Lamb's Book of Life. He's forgiven your sins. He's made you right with Himself. He promises you an eternity with Him. But He also calls on us to make a public profession of our faith. So I want to encourage you to do that just by reaching out to us. You can just text the word SAVED to the number right there on your screen and someone will connect with you and pray with you and give you some next steps. And we look forward to doing that. Once again, thank you so much for joining us for today's message. Thank you for praying with us and God richly bless you is our prayer for you today.